Good morning. I'm Representative Dave Pinto. I'm the chair of the House Early Childhood Finance and Policy Committee, and I'm calling this meeting of the committee to order. Uh, welcome to members of the public. You'll find uh, information about the, the hearing uh, on our committee website, including an agenda and meeting materials, etc. cetera. Uh, this meeting is being held pursuant to House Rule 10.01, which allows for virtual <clears throat> meetings of this type. Uh, Mr. Dozen, if you can please start us off by taking the roll. Morning, everyone. Uh, Representative Pinto, Chair. Present. Representative Pryor, Vice Chair. Present. Lead Franzen. Present. Representative Bennett. Present. Representative Bolden. Present. Representative Daniels. Daniels present. Representative Daphne. Representative Daphne. Representative Damas. Present. Representative Jurgens. Representative Jurgens. Jurgens present. Representative Kotiza Watun. Present. Representative Morrison. Morrison present. Representative Waslowick. Waslowick present. Representative Wolgamot. Wolgamot present. And one more time, Representative Dabney. Mr. Dozen, I think uh, uh, Representative Dabney had uh, is excused. He contacted us. He has a bill being presented in another committee um, that may not have gotten to you. Yeah. All right. I have a marked as well. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dozeland. Um, and um, uh, Representative Pryor, if you can move approval of our minutes from March 15th from Tuesday. So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Um, any additions or corrections to those minutes, members? And not hearing any, uh, all in favor of approval of the March 15th minutes, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so the motion passes, our minutes are adopted. Um, so members, we're starting off with a uh, report on uh, parent aware uh, to remind you all, we had uh, uh, actually last spring directed two things uh, relating to parent aware. One is a, um, I think a validation study is the right term that will take a couple of years to complete. I think we'll hopefully hear more about that along the way, but we wanted to have something that got back to us more quickly as well. Um, and uh, so uh, there's a report on um, any barriers to uh, folks from a wide variety of backgrounds being able to participate in the parent aware um, system, which is Minnesota's quality rating and improvement system. Um, this is a particularly important issue to me, as I'm sure we'll get into, and I know to all of you as well. So um, we have uh, Barty Wahi, who many of us know in her work from Children's Defense Fund, and she's, uh, I think, Deputy Assistant Commissioner uh, at DHS, and so glad to have her with us. And, and uh, Ms. Wahi, if you can uh, uh, introduce yourself and then please proceed. So glad to have you with us. I'm not hearing you if you're speaking. Thank you, Chair Pinto. I got oh, it. There we go. Hey. Um, thank you, Chair Pinto and members of the community, uh, committee. My name is Barty Wahi, and I am the, uh, as you said, new deputy commissioner, uh, deputy assistant commissioner of the Children and Families Administration at the Department of Human Services. It's lovely to be uh, with the committee today um, in this capacity, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about the Parent Aware Equity Report. So um, you'll notice there is a, a slide uh, presentation in front of you. Um, so the parent, uh, parent Aware Equity Report, um, as you said, Chair Pinto, the, uh, it was legislatively mandated through legislation enact, enacted in the 2021 special session. And it required outreach to be conducted to racially, ethnically, linguistically, and geographically diverse providers to identify barriers that prevented them from pursuing the Parent Aware rating. Um, the legislation also required a report to be completed by March 1, 2022, and that report is posted on the Department of Human Services and the Parent Aware um, website. And that report really summarizes um, and submits results of this outreach effort and a plan for reducing barriers identified. Um, additional information about the engagement process and the final outreach report are also posted on the Parent Aware website. So. Um, the outreach and engagement process. Um, through a, a contract with Carol, Frank, and Associates, the department conducted a multi-layered outreach campaign to racially and geographically diverse child care providers. 
Um, I think we wanna preface this um, particular presentation by also just acknowledging that the legislatively mandated deadline of March 1, 2022, um, uh, made it challenging to provide deeply, uh, deeply centered community um, uh, process and an inclusive process. The reality is that equitable outcomes uh, for children, uh, families, and providers do, uh, requires an equitable and inclusive process. And really, truly authentic, meaningful engagement takes more time than was allowed given the legislative deadline. Um, it requires trust and relationship building and community. Um, the department staff compensated by leveraging information and recommendations from other ongoing efforts to make parent aware more inclusive and equitable, including the parent um, ongoing parent aware reports for continuous quality improvement, information um, from the child care task, uh, the family child care task force report, and also findings from the parent aware racial equity action team engagement process. And this process was a parallel to the um, engagement uh, effort that took place for the equity report I'm sharing with you today. Um, an engaged community for well over a year. It was funded um, by our partners at Blue Cross Blue Shield um, Foundation. And the report for this process is, was also recently released titled the Parent Aware Racial Equity Action Plan. Um, the, this particular report that we're talking about today, the Parent Aware Equity Report, um, the engagement process included one-on-one -on -one phone interviews, small group um, virtual sessions that were conducted, um, conducted online with childcare providers and other partners, and then also an online survey. Um, next slide. Interviewers were um, interviewers who were uh, talking and speaking with providers were racially and ethnically diverse and spoke languages that included Spanish, Hmong, Somali, and Urdu. Um, in addition to English. Interviewers were demographically aligned with providers to the extent that it was possible. Participants in this engagement process included black, indigenous, and providers of color, as well as white providers in greater Minnesota, as well, and included stakeholders from the Twin Cities metro area, as well as stakeholders in greater Minnesota. And providers were asked specifically, what prevents, from, uh, what prevents them from earning and maintaining a parent aware rating? and what would be helpful and in, in, in useful in helping them overcome those barriers. Next slide. So in gathering this information, the barriers to earning the parent aware rating were really fell into some very specific um, categories, five to be precise. Um, the first was process and consistency, process consistency, information and perceptions. Um, geographic and technology access, experience and literacy, cultural proficiency, relationships and trust, language access and jargon, and then finally, expertise definitions and recognition. Specifically, providers expressed struggles with requirements, forms, documentation, and limited scheduling options, which they said made it worse if they participated in other programs that also required separate paperwork as well, such as the child care assistant, uh, such as child care assistance. Many um, black indigenous and providers of color um, and providers in greater Minnesota also expressed direct concerns about not having access to technology and internet services that were needed um, to complete the parent aware application process. Access alone provided an enormous barrier for, again, Black, Indigenous, and providers of color, as well as providers in greater Minnesota for training, coaching, and information access and navigating the parent aware uh, process. Also highlighted were parent aware approved curriculum, materials and information didn't always adequately include or recognize cultural and tribal differences and norms. And the definitions of what constitute quality childcare do not, re do not always recognize the varying forms that this can take across culture. While there are parent aware coaches that are from Black, Indigenous, and um, communities of color, and a, a fair amount of work has, has taken place here in the metro area around that. Um, languages um, uh, and, uh, and uh, the inclusion of other languages other than English, providers engaged and identified a need for more racial, ethnic, and linguistic diversity among coaches. Providers felt that coaches have limited cultural proficiency and understanding around trauma-informed care. 
And too few coaches have experiences with multi-age family childcare settings. So that being a critical component as well. Language barriers also prevented many providers from using parent aware or completing the application process. And excess jargon, um, it was a difficult barrier for providers and make parent aware, the application process difficult for providers whose first language was not English and likely probably providers whose first language is English. Engagement results also found that many racially and geographic providers are saying uh, did find many things that were really working and, and many things that they valued and should be expanded. Primarily, providers said that they really appreciate the opportunity for coaching and supports that Parent Aware offers for learning and development and just to become better um, providers. They also very much appreciated the Parent Aware quality grants that help them purchase items for their program and help accomplish their goals as they're continuing their own professional development journey. So, um, next slide. The department proposes both short and long term strategies to address the parent aware participation barriers that we heard in this report. These include um, changes to the parent aware advisory structure required to make lasting and ongoing improvement, as well as short term strategies that can begin prior to the um, to the uh, major parent aware evaluation that Chair Pinto referenced. Um, and those could be carried out between now um, and uh, December 20 uh, of 2024, while long-term strategies that need more time to be developed and cannot be started prior to the completion of the evaluation um, can uh, and addressed uh, between January 2024 and in, through June 2026. Next slide. So just very briefly, a newly restructured Parent Aware Advisory Council will be launched this spring. This advisory uh, group will be more implementation focused and utilize smaller work groups to explore options for policy changes recommended in these reports and, um, and also the ones that may be identified in the future with the Parent Aware Evaluation. The process will leverage in ongoing engagement meetings with providers and user experience testing. And for each recommendation, the advisory committee will help with its small groups, uh, with it, the help of its small groups, will develop alternatives for implementation while staff can help support costing out those options and the department can assess feasibility as well. You know, there are a, a whole host of other short term um, uh, uh, strategies that we are also considering. Again, streamlining forms um, used by providers to really um, uh, create, uh, to ensure that the agency is following plain language standards and are designed to make them easier and faster to use. Data systems um, uh, to be upgraded more closely aligned with the forms in the field. Um, I think really, um, again, hearing technology was critical, providing individualized assessments of a provider's access to computers and technology and encouraging those experiencing gaps to apply for the parent aware and child care services grants. Co expanding coaching and training to parent aware um, and uh, access to quality coaches who meet provider language and cultural needs. We will also explore methods for involving parent aware coaches and providers, so making stronger matches between the two. We wanna increase outreach and supports for culturally and linguistically diverse providers to access higher education scholarships for degrees and credentials. And then we're also considering exploring a new, path, new pathways to becoming rated, creating separate forms for families, uh, for family child care providers customized to their family child care setting needs, um, as well as explore um, more individualized self-paced rating options. Next slide. Some of the long-term strategies that we're really looking at is more opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and, and mentoring and supports. Understanding that um, through infrastructure design to recognize that really um, that kind of peer support can be a really critical sort of learning opportunity and coaching effort. We are also looking at really gathering more data on race and ethnicities, improving our data, um, because that supports our equity analysis, especially around race and ethnicity of those operating and working in childcare and early care settings. It's important to know what our workforce looks like and to have better data on that. 
We are exploring options that include um, efforts around training and including indicators that recognize and reward providers who come with cultural competency and cultural responsiveness in their instructional um, strategy. We are also looking at training and degrees and increased access to flexible pathways for training and degrees because we recognize that's important. Um, we will continue with, uh, we will be completing the parent aware evaluation and using those results combined with additional engagement to help continue to improve the, the system. And again, standards and indicators are going to be considered in our parent aware redesign efforts. And we're working to, uh, we will be working to update the framework standard and indicators to better reflect the diversity of individuals experiences and ideas. Um, again, just to provide a little bit of a timeline around that parent aware evaluation. Um, we will be working on those ideas um, and changes to the indicators. Those will be developed by June of 2024. The parent aware evaluation and department recommendations will be completed by December of 2024. And decisions on final changes will be made in June of 2025. And we will hope to roll out those um, changes, uh, make those changes, and then roll those out on in June of 2026. So that was a lot of information. I'll pause there and see if you all have questions. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Wahi, um, for that. Uh, members, uh, questions that folks have, and I should note that we have quite a few people uh, on the line with us available to answer questions. I think there may be a, my list includes five people in addition to uh, the, uh, the commissioner here. Um, so members, uh, please raise hands if you have some, otherwise I'll, I'll dive in in the, in the meantime. Um, just one thing I wanted to make sure I noticed this in the report, but if you could just expand on it, that um, uh, this is an equity report uh, and we're concerned, of course, about racial um, uh, diversity and geographic diversity. I noticed in here, just to confirm that this did include providers both in the Metro and in greater Minnesota, it included providers, I think the executive summary says includes both um, uh, BIPOC providers, white providers. So this is really across the, the uh, whole spectrum of providers. Can you just sort of talk about that, um, Commissioner? Yes, um, the process, um, uh, despite sort of a limited time for that engagement process, did include a diverse group of providers, um, both really um, with a focus on making sure we had uh, connection and, and spoken with uh, providers in greater Minnesota, as well as uh, BIPOC providers here um, metro in the metro area and in other spaces. So yes, the, every effort was made to have a diverse set of providers informing this report. Okay, good. Thanks so much. I want to kind of highlight that. And then um, can you just uh, also clarify, there's the note in the presentation about a separate parent aware racial equity report, which does get a little confusing because this is a parent aware equity report. There's a separate parent aware racial equity report, which we did not order. I think that's like a separate, I did not mandate. That's a separate thing that was going on. Can you just sort of help us understand that and, and expand that on that a little bit? And then uh, President Pryor, then I'll call on you after that. Let's My commissioner, if you can. <clears throat> yes. So as you, um, as we uh, said, this particular report that I'm reporting on today, the Parent Aware Equity Report was legislatively mandated uh, as a part of a special session. Um, and it was spoke, it focused specifically on barriers. That was sort of the task of this particular report. Barriers to participating to, for, um, in uh, Parent Aware for racially, ethnically, linguistically, and demographically diverse stakeholders. Um, and it was really, um, you know, to really to look at what those specific barriers were. Um, you know, the, the racial equity um, action plan, it was, re or the racial equity action plan, sorry, there's so many similar words there, um, uh, was really a, a public and private partnership that was really developed um, uh, with Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation um, to, and, and was a much longer engagement process. Um, uh, as I said, uh, a process that included, uh, that went for well over um, a year and, and was really looking at very, um, much more specific things and, and really looking at how to make parent aware more inclusive. So it, it, expanding from just the more specific barriers um, that were looked at in the report I'm talking to you today, really looking at a, a whole host of efforts to to make um, parent aware more inclusive. Okay, I, and I'm not sure that we have a copy of that, which of course, I, it doesn't sound like the DHS put together in any case, but um, if somebody is listening and, and has a copy that we can post on our committee website, I'd like to have committee members be able to access that, we can get that out to members. So I don't think it's posted right. I don't think we received it right now. So 
Um, if folks can, whoever, if somebody's listening and can send that in, that'd be great. Um, uh, Representative Pryor, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have two questions, um, if that's all right, if we have yep. time. And the first question um, is about essentially the steps that are being taken now or in the future. And, and even that question has two parts. Um, the second part is being legislatively, um, you know, if there's, if there's a role for us, if there's um, something identified that the legislature can do, um, our body can do, this committee can do, um, would like to hear that specifically. But then also um, just, I, I guess I would like to know you know, kind of what's going on right now, because some of the things that were listed as um, recommendations seem to be things that can be actually have started um, right now, like, you know, the form, uh, the forms and making that uh, the paperwork more accessible and that kind of process. And also the idea of with our new virtual reality that we can, we don't have to go to a location. Um, the ability to, if it's, if there's an initiative right now to take the, the, um, that language barrier and and connect coaches that do have that um, do have that language um, uh, competency um, to work with new providers and if they are being um, spread across the straight state and places where they're needed because we can do that virtually. So any of those things that are happening right now or um, plans to get those things underway? Um, sure. <clears throat> uh, uh, thank you, Vice Chair Pryor, um, Representative uh, uh, Chair Pinto. Um, uh, yes, um, you know, I think that there are efforts that are already taking place. Um, as we said, this particular report effort um, is actually embedded in a larger effort that um, the uh, that DHS staff are working on to to work on um, making sure that parent aware um, continues the work of being uh, inclusive and um, uh, meeting the needs of providers um, across the state. Um, you know, uh, I think that some of the things I would just highlight is um, I think the uh, effort to to really focus on um, the newly restructured parent aware advisory group. I think, you know, we continue to hear that it is important to, to, to not just reach out to community once, but to stay in relationship and continue to work with community providers and, um, and folks um, consistently and regularly as we continue to move through this effort of inclusivity. Um, and so uh, that is, I think, a really key critical strategy that will be happening that, you know, that is in process now. Um, uh, also, you know, again, coming back to some of those short-term opportunities, again, the streamline of forms, the, um, uh, the, the development of data systems, all of those pieces are things that I think um, the staff are considering and moving along. And I think as we continue to, to assess what we've heard from the various spaces in which we gathered information, I think there's definitely an opportunity to work with this particular um, committee um, as we, you know, as we think about how to move these things forward and as we assess plans for, for policy and, and, and budget. Representative Pryor, you had another question? I did have a second question. Thank you. I, I noticed in the in the report that I read and also in your presentation, you talked about pursuing um, avenues for scholarships um, and um, knowing that as you as you attain education, you um, are move up the steps for uh, quality, you know, uh, of quality uh, in the parent aware system. So um, is that something that they're, where are you looking? And I know that we've, got, we've had some um, scholarship programs with our, um, our community, our state state university system um, workforce scholarships, and just wondering if that's something specifically that came up and that you're seeking now. For sure. Um, yes, I mean I think that we we've heard from people that you know people need additional resources in order to make those next steps happen, and I think you know we're also thinking about how we can um, really do two things, right? It is about like the support and recruitment of um, geographically and racially diverse um, providers as well as coaches in the system. So thinking about how, what kinds of supports are necessary to help people who are again, um, moving through a system of, uh, of, of improving their education. So, I mean, I think that that's still in development, but 
I think that there is definitely an interest amongst the community about how that what that support could look like and how we can help um, help support providers in their journey around this this component. Um, scholarships for higher education um, are also related to increasing our um, is also um, a, a scholarships for higher education in the plan is related to increasing uh, to increasing outreach generally. Okay, Representative Pryor, looks like your hand's back down. Y'all done? Okay. Okay. Um, so then Representative Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for this presentation. Um, I didn't hear a whole lot about financial barriers uh, in, in the reports in the presentation, So, uh, and that's something I sometimes hear from providers, uh, that the, the cost of uh, resources and materials is sometimes a, a barrier for entry into the system, and I just wonder if you could speak a little bit about those costs and, and what your findings were around that. Commissioner. Um, Chair Pinto, Representative Bolden, I'm sorry, I missed the last half of what you it, just asked. I'm sorry. I, I, it I, was a little bit, it was a little bit tough to hear. Representative Bolden, it's a little bit echoey in your, uh, it's kind of hard, a little bit hard to hear you. So is this better, Mr. Chair? I think it's a little bit better. Yeah. Okay, I'll try again. Um, so my question is around uh, the financial barriers, uh, potentially with the program. I sometimes hear, I didn't hear a lot about that. Uh, and so just a, a question about that. I sometimes hear from providers that that uh, expenses for materials and resources is a barrier to entry into the program. And so I just wonder if you could speak a little bit about those costs and, and your, your findings, if any, related to that. Sure. Sorry. Um, I lost you all for a minute there. Um, um, so the the question was really about cost and the cost, you know, the cost of materials and the efforts to um, to uh, uh, um, apply and, and and to move through the process. And I guess I would just, you know, cost is always, uh, I think, a critical barrier. Um, uh, we didn't have a lot of findings that were tied to financial barriers. It just wasn't what came up, at least in the context of this report. I would highlight um, <clears throat> that uh, when we did ask the question, um, you know, one of the things that people, when they when they talked about barriers, we also did hear um, from providers that they did eval uh, they did value the parent aware quality grants that help them purchase items. So there are some tools in the system that can help support um, people as they're as they're thinking about items like. Um, uh, purchase items for their program to help some of, uh, accomplish some of those goals and, and and some of those pieces. So there are some resources that currently exist, but I you know I think your point of you know could there be more? But specifically in the context of this report, cost just didn't come up as as frequently as some of the other pieces that people identified as critical barriers. Representative Bolin, okay, hand down there, just looking to see others. And um, Krishna, can you just, uh, this is just building over Chair Vice Chair Pryor to ask, but just, so are there, because of course we have a couple of weeks left where we could be moving bills. Um, is there anything that this report calls on us to do or wants, it's saying that the legislature can do uh, this session in the short term? Because um, when I look at it, it looks like the, most of the stuff in the short term is, are items that really would not be in our hands. And I just wanna, before you go, I wanna make sure if there's something that you're asking for us to do that we get to hear what that is so we can evaluate it. Um, you know, I, I think that I think that one of the things that I would just um, offer up to the committee, um, uh, represent, uh, Chair uh, Pinto um, and committee um, is that, you know, I think that not only is the engagement process a long-term process, like engaging the community, understanding these pieces are, but I think also some of the efforts that we highlighted in the context of some of the long-term strategies require will require some long-term long-term supports. And so um, I will say that making any system, particularly a state system, inclusive and equitable, just requires intention and effort and consistency. So um, as we continue to move forward through not only this session, but I think as we move forward um, in um, uh, into and certainly into next year, um, I think um, you know some long-term supports would be really helpful. I would also highlight, I think again, the pandemic being a, a really critical learning about the importance of technology, both in terms of, I think, uh, uh, as uh, Vice Chair Pryor mentioned, you know, we've also learned about the opportunity of 
a, a shrinking world when you can um, participate via Zoom. And so, um, you know, I, I think that uh, really thinking about how we can also support providers as they upgrade in technology, it's not oftentimes an area or a um, an industry that we think about technology upgrades and, and really the need for support in those areas. So I, I think we would, um, I think I would highlight some of those pieces. Um, uh, and we know that the um, uh, providing funding for technology grants um, is in the governor's proposal as well. Okay, I'm looking to see if there are other questions. Um, so, and I'll do, I just wanna highlight for members that uh, of course we couldn't have heard this report earlier because the deadline was what it was as, as it was, things are really tight, but I really wanna make sure to take a little bit of time this morning. Um, and just wanna highlight for members that, um, you know, the concept of quality is really important to all of us who wanna make sure children have enriching experiences. And right now our state is using this system of parent aware and there are concerns been expressed about it from various directions, no system is perfect. We also know that there's a lot that, a lot that supports it as well. And um, as we're making our uh, decisions about spending the next few weeks and beyond, um, it's important to me that we um, just be thinking about how we're, how we're doing that in relation to this QRIS quality rating improvement system um, that we have in Minnesota and, and are able to make sure that it as effective as possible. So I guess I'll, um, Commissioner, to you and to, um, to your colleagues, uh, boy, if you do identify anything in particular that we can do, uh, we would need to get those ideas right away and be able to move on them. If, in terms of anything, to, uh, um, this session, and I take your point that this is a long-term thing, we need to be thinking long-term, uh, and we're in a spot right now that we're, where there are some things we can um, be at least trying to move through um, shortly, and so if there's anything, please send it our way. Um, Commissioner, any final comments for you? No, I just want to thank the committee. Um, uh, Chair Pinto, I want to thank the committee for allowing us to share this report. And um, and uh, we uh, can also um, ensure that uh, members of the committee also um, have a chance to see the parent aware racial equity action plan as well. Yeah, and, and, that, and my understanding is that will be that'll be sent out uh, members and, and members of the public will post it on the on the website for this hearing uh, as well. Um, and so good. Well, Commissioner, thank you for uh, for all of your work before your time at DHS and now in your in your new role. Um, and thanks to everyone who put together this um, this report. Um, and please continue to be in touch. This is a really important uh, issue. So thank you so much. Good thank stuff. You. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Um, so uh, members, then we're moving to a couple of bills. Um, we have um, Representative Katiza Wittoon's uh, House File 4278. And so Rep Representative Katiza Wittoon, um, do you wish to move to uh, refer that bill to the Committee on Workforce and Business Development? I would, so move, Mr. Chair. Okay, and then Representative Katiza Wittoon, you have an author's amendment in A1, which I think is maybe just technical, but I could be wrong about that. Can you just let us know about that? Thank you, Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, <clears throat> The A1 amendment does include some more specific language um, that we would like to see included in the study, and that was based on um, guidance and feedback from uh, MDE. Okay, okay, so this is some technical assistance from the administration. Um, so uh, I'll just, uh, so, uh, and are you moving approval of the A1 amendment? I would. Um, members, I would appreciate your support. Okay, so just see if anybody has any questions about that. Um, I'm responding to that TA, not seeing any. So all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. So we now have uh, House File 4278 amended. And so you have it, uh, we have it before us. Members of Cotiz Wittoon, please present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, House File 4278 is a one-time funding request to refresh a comprehensive study of our early childhood workforce. Uh, we know that this is, this is such an important piece of the discussion that we have here in this committee. The most comparable data that we have currently is over 10 years old from a study that was done by Wilder through DHS with childcare and early education staffing levels in crisis mode. It's critical for legislators and advocates to have the most current and comprehensive data on who is actually in the workforce currently, why they've entered the workforce, why they're leaving, um, access to benefits, barriers to entry, et cetera. Uh, since this is purely a workforce issue, we worked with DEED on the language and then MDE, as I uh, mentioned in the amendment, have given some additional feedback uh, <clears throat> that's now reflected in the bill as amended. This study isn't just about where we have shortages. It's trying to figure out what the baseline of the field is when it comes to teachers of color, education levels, access to benefits, et cetera. In other words, it would help 
with many of the goals we have in diversifying the field and offering more education and work supports to our child care industry. Whereas the analysis of how many kids need care and how many staff are maybe currently on site or who has been closing their doors, this has been the focus of many other recent surveys, but this uh, study will give us a unique and current perspective with which to examine these persisting challenges in our early childhood systems and how COVID has exacerbated these issues over the past two years. <clears throat> um, there's a group called Transforming Minnesota's Early Childhood Workforce, which is made up of advocates from Child Care Aware, the West Central Initiative, Think Small, and various agency staff. And today um, I have Anne McCauley with me with Child Care Aware to share her thoughts. So um, with that, Mr. Chair, I would I would ask Ms. McCauley to continue on. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kadiz Wittun and, and Ms. McCauley, so glad to have you with us. You've been working incredibly hard on these issues. And um, so yeah, please identify yourself and proceed. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Pinto and members. Uh, my name is Ann McCulley, and I am Executive Director of Child Care Aware of Minnesota. I'm here to speak just briefly about uh, House File 4278. Um, as you can see from many posted letters of support on the website today, this bill does reflect an interest from many partners. And as Representative Kotiza Wutun mentioned, it is a top legislative priority for transforming Minnesota's early childhood workforce. Uh, quickly, we are, as mentioned, a public-private initiative that was funded or founded and funded in uh, 2016, and we really try to research, analyze, consider, and recommend policy issues related to the early childhood workforce. Um, the reason for this bill, as you heard, is straightforward. When we're considering the needs of our early educators, those, I like to say, the adults in the room, um, in all of the settings that are named in the amendment you just uh, approved, we don't really know who the current audience is. Um, the last comprehensive report, as mentioned, was uh, the data was gathered in 2011. The report came out in 2012. And at that time, it really helped to set a baseline for things like what is the race, ethnicity, language spoken in our field? What were the wages? What access did our folks have to benefits? Um, what levels of education already existed, et cetera? And data since 2012 either doesn't exist at all or it exists scattered across in bits and pieces. And we certainly don't have really much of anything around the actual workforce since the pandemic began. And we all can imagine that has changed. Um, I, I do want to point out quickly that there are many initiatives that were passed by this legislature even last year where we could truly benefit from having this data, just to put it in, into context. Uh, the Great Start for All Minnesota Child Children Task Force um, has as one of its main three focuses, ensuring that Minnesota's early childhood educators are qualified, diverse, supported, and equitably compensated regardless of setting. So unless we know where they're starting in those categories, it's going to be hard to move forward and implement the recommendations that will be coming out next year. Um, for instance, also like, uh, the TEACH Early Childhood Scholarship Program and the Retain Grant Program, which happens to be implemented through our agency, um, that's a focus on helping people get higher education degrees and then retain them in the field. Um, we would really benefit from having a good new updated look at who's out there, with certification, with degrees, what level, and that would really uh, would help us pinpoint our outreach and our promotion. And finally, the upcoming launch that, uh, again, our system is going to be heavily involved with of the One Stop Assistance Network and other truly capacity building initiatives, looking at the early childhood field. If we understand what's happening in terms of the baseline, we know where we need to head in terms of building the kind of workforce that best reflects the needs of the children and the families of Minnesota. So we're here to just say, please support House File 4278. And thank you for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much again, uh, Ms. McCauley. Thanks for, for your testimony today and also for your work. Um, and so I think, so again, we have um, quite a few people on the line who are available for uh, answering questions. Um, and many thanks, by the way, I should have thanked the folks on the last on the Parent Aware Report <clears throat> that it's so good to have people on, even if you're not the one testifying, that to be available for, for our questions. Uh, members, I'm just seeing if there are any other representative wise like you do, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, not a question, just wanna thank Representative Katiza Wittun for bringing this bill forward. Um, just from all the conversations that I've had with, um, specifically with the school-based childcare program that I work in, um, staff shortages are a huge issue. Um, and so understanding more about what the field looks like in terms of who's, who's working and what their compensation is and benefits and all those things, I think can help us um, as legislators uh, 
learn more about what we can do, what solutions we can propose to help um, child care providers, whether that's centers or home-based or wherever, wherever the care is being provided, um, that we can consider solutions to that problem. Um, I think it's, uh, I think we're going to see that problem continue just like in other sectors. Um, and so I'm grateful to have the opportunity to, to get some more information about um, who's working in the field and to hopefully be able to come up with some um, legislative proposals to, to help uh, address some of the issues that we know will likely come out of that report. Thank you. Thank you, Represent Representative Roslewick. Uh, Representative Fryer. Uh, oh, thank you, Mr. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I, I have to well echo what we just heard from um, our presenter, from uh, the bill author, and from Representative Wozlik. This is a much needed study. And I'm wondering, um, uh, Representative Katiza Watun, if you could just review, uh, review, review for us uh, kind of like the timelines so that we can, you know, as a committee, as a body, uh, think about when, how the study can be conducted, and then we'll get the feedback from it that we can start really um, acting on um, what our findings are. And Representative uh, Katiza Watun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Vice President. Vice Chair Pryor for that question. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a, a like I mentioned, it's a one-time fiscal appropriation. It's um, $255,000 in um, fiscal year 2023. And the, the study is required to be completed within 18 months. Um, while we have talked to DEED about doing it internally, there is language that allows it to con them to contract out if that uh, makes more sense or kind of work in, in partnership. And then these funds would be available until December of 2023. So, um, Rough, roughly just over um, 18 months from now, obviously, when, when the funds are um, portioned out from the general fund, shall, shall this be passed into law? Now we'll and, be able to make decisions in, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, 2024. Okay, thank you. And Representative Pryor, your hands back down. So, okay. Because actually, I'm Representative Katiz with you, and I, I had a, um, I guess, a thought or a question on that. Um, I mean, we will be making budgetary decisions. The legislature will be making budgetary decisions next spring. Um, it'd be good to have whatever information is available. I wonder if you might consider um, an interim report. Um, I know that the report is both kind of data, just hard objective, you know, who's in the field, what's their background, how much, how much are they making, and then also more of an analysis about barriers, et cetera. And I wonder if you might consider maybe those could be separated out. I'm just thinking that you know, it's a bummer that we would be making budgetary decisions, the legislature would, and then we get some information midway through. So is there, is that something, maybe this, maybe Ms. McCulley would be a good person to comment on some of that, but I'll, I'll direct the bill's author to decide how she wants to handle my question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I, that is a point well taken. And I, and I think um, certainly um, if we're, if we're able to kind of portion out or, or just make it be sort of an interim report, I'm, I'm open to discussion on that. And certainly we have um, lots of conversation to come ahead of us in workforce and business development. Um, I know Chair Dabney and I um, sit on that committee together. So uh, <clears throat> we'll definitely be able to bring some of this discussion into committee there, but um, certainly I would, I would love to hear Ms. McCulley's um, uh, input on, on that possibility. Ms. McCauley, sure. could you comment on that? I, we, we have a number of reports where we're finding ourselves, just, and of course it takes a while to get um, for the things to, uh, to come along. I'm seeing Representative Damoth on my screen going, oh, this has been a frustration for her. And I'm just thinking we want the information as quickly as we can to be able to use. Um, so just any thoughts as to what I've what I've said? Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. And Representative Patiza Watun. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, we, we would love to see things move as quickly as possible. Of course, I would defer to our, our friends at Deed to to comment on timelines and what that looks like. Um, I do like your idea of perhaps breaking out some of the data, early data and later data. I guess the one thing I would say is even if there is passage of legislation next session, usually much of this gets used when it comes around to, to implementation. So even if some of the data is coming later, when we're getting ready to really implement the programs, should they be programs certainly that we would be implementing, for instance, we would still have time to use the data in more complete detail as we're truly out in the field. So I think there's ways to slice and dice this, but I am not a research expert. I do know that this is because of the very complex nature of our system that we call a system. Um, and you can see in the amendment, all the different audiences, I think it's a little bit more complex than you know, some of us even tracking down and finding some some folks. So that might be part of the reason why it's a little bit longer um, runway. Uh, and then there's a lot of data sets involved. Um, so I, that's about as much as I can answer. If, if I'm understanding your response, Ms. McCauley, too, um, you know, 
legislators tend to, I guess we all probably see the world from our own perspective. So I'm thinking, oh, this is data for us in making decisions. But actually, if I'm understanding you right, you're saying this is at least as much and maybe more information to be used that whatever decision the legislature makes, then as agencies and others are implementing them, they've got this available to them. So it's kind of less to us and more to um, folks who'd be implementing programs that we enact. Uh, is that my understanding you right, Ms. McCauley? Mr. Chair, I think it helps all of us. I think it helps yeah. in, in guiding decision making, and I also think it helps in implementing those decisions. Thank you. Okay, and and then just a, another question: Is there going to be a separation between um, uh, it's kind of different infant and toddler care versus preschool care, et cetera? And I, am I right in thinking that there'll be a um, that those differences uh, would be taken into account? Maybe to Ms. McCauley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, one of the reasons we, we didn't want to make this, you know, a seven mile long bill, but I think one of the expectations is there would be some advisory groups when the Wilder Foundation did this, or Wilder Research did this 12 years ago, I was on that advisory as well. And there was a, an effort to bring some people around the table to talk about what would be the most useful and meaningful data sets. And I do think our, our friends at Deed are open to doing that again. So that's a perfect example of something where as we dig a little deeper, even under the list of things you see in the um, amendment, there will likely be some further differentiation. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I think the chair has taken up far too much time because um, I just get fascinated by this stuff. I'm seeing Representative Katiza Wittoon. Yeah, I'll, I'll go to you. I, I saw Representative Pryor's hands back up. But thank Representative you. Katiza Wittoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, I, I certainly want to hear from Vice Chair Pryor again, but it does look like um, we have a friend from Deed who um, put their oh. video on and might want to uh, might want to chip in here. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting that. Yeah. Um, uh, so before we go to before we go to you, Representative Pryor, Ms. Cassell, I'm welcome to you. And if you can please identify yourself and, and proceed. Thank you, Chair Pinto and Representative uh, uh, Katiza Watoon. My name is Oriane Cassell. I'm the Assistant Director of the Labor Market Information at Deed. Um, and I just wanted to comment on the timeline um, since that I, I do understand the issue here. Um, this would kind of be a two part study. One would be looking at existing data and the other part would be gathering data through uh, surveys of various um, child care center, the child care centers and the family child care uh, programs. Um, that would take a lot longer. Um, running a survey like that would mean really contacting probably every single uh, provider um, to make sure that we really understood the data that they were giving us. Um, but the initial data gathering of existing data could be done sooner, and that could definitely be reported out sooner uh, through like an interim study, interim report. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then Representative Pryor. I, I'll throw out there real quick. Uh, <laughs> as we said, it's kind of broad right now, and you'll be getting lots of advice for what should be in the study and, and what specifically should be looked at. And since this is my opportunity right now, I'd also be interested, and I think as Representative Katiza Wittun mentioned, people that are leaving, and and particularly, I think, in, in um, child, um, child, uh, child care centers, maybe if there's churn in um, people being hired, then they get a better offer and they move on, you know, what's going on in, with that population and how can we stabilize the workforce there? So, you know, just throwing that out as, uh, as another suggestion when, when we get into actually collecting the data. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Pryor. Okay, looking to see, not seeing other uh, hands up. And so um, Representative Katiza Wittoon will give you the chance to um, uh, have the last word as usual on your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thanks for the, the uh, positive discussion today. I think that um, we all know that um, we have to take a look at what's a deeper look at what's going on in the child care industry um, today um, after two years of battling a pandemic and uh, many parents having to leave the workforce to be home with their kids, uh, many child care providers having to potentially close their doors or stay open and, and uh, chair, uh, take care of children whose parents were our frontline workers. Um, there's just a lot of new information that's happened over the past decade plus. And so I think that this study will really help us take a look at where things stand and then uh, make positive changes going forward into the future. So uh, I, I would appreciate the support. Good, thank you so much, Representative Katiza Wittoon. Um, this is, uh, we've been hearing a lot in our committee, of course, over the last couple of years about this um, critical, I think it's Commissioner Harpstead calls them the workforce behind the workforce in all kinds of ways. 
and um, just under enormous, enormous stress. So we want to know what's going on and, and how they can be helpful. So uh, thank you. So um, I'm not seeing any further uh, uh, questions or comments. So um, uh, Representative Katiza Wittun renews her motion in the House File 4278 as amended uh, be uh, re-referred to the Committee on Workforce and Business Development. And so Mr. Dozland, um, please take the roll. Representative Pinto, Chair. Aye. Vice Chair Pryor. Aye. Need Franzen. No. Representative Bennett. No. Representative Bolden. Bolden, aye. Representative Daniels. No. Representative Davney. Davney, aye. Representative Damas. Aye. Representative Jurgens. Jurgens, aye. Representative Cotiza Watoon. Aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Representative Waslowick. Waslowick, aye. And Representative Wolgamot. Aye. The vote results in 10 ayes and three nays. Thank you, Mr. Doslin. So my vote of 10 to 3 on the motion passes. And uh, Representative Cotiza Watoon uh, and Ms. McCauley, um, the bill is on its way to uh, Committee on Workforce and Business Development. And again, many thanks to, uh, to Ms. McCauley, uh, Ms. Casella, and to the many, many people who put so much work into this. Um, I should have noted I had the chance to, to work quite a bit with the Transforming Minnesota's Early Childhood Workforce group that Representative Cotiza Watoon referenced. And um, they've just been doing enormously good work. So, so thank you again, and you're on your way. Um, so Representative Wozlewick, uh, then House File 4133, and I believe that you're moving uh, to bring that bill before us, um, expecting to put it in uh, to review it for possible inclusion in our budget bill, but uh, is that your motion? Yep, that is my motion, Mr. Chair. Excellent, thank you. So Representative Wozlewick, um, please, and I think no amendments on this bill that I'm seeing, so uh, please proceed uh, with your uh, presenting your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you members for taking some time to hear the bill today. Um, this bill is pretty simple in what it's doing. Um, the bill removes the sunset date um, and the scale down requirement for the stabilization base grants um, for child care providers, and then provides ongoing state funding for the grants. Um, and you'll see in the bill language, um, the appropriation um, for, for that continuing funding of the grants. Um, I have heard some concerns from family child care providers uh, Ms. Cunningham, uh, Cindy Cunningham provided some testimony um, and I have a meeting that I'm going to be that I have set up with her next week to discuss some of those concerns and hopefully we can figure out a way to move forward with this and make sure that, um, you know, everybody who's um, using the program has their has their needs met. So that's, that's all I have. I, I guess I will add, um, you know, throughout the, the committee um, time when we've had child care providers testifying, a lot of them have mentioned the stabilization grants as being a key piece of them being able to stay open, um, particularly uh, within during the pandemic as we've sort of been in and out of waves um, that those those uh, funds have really helped them um, stay open and make sure that they're there to serve kids and families. So I want to I want to continue that. I think we're, we're still in a sort of a transition period, I think, where there are still some difficulties that are being faced. Um, COVID is still around. Uh, staff shortages are, are existing. So want to make sure that we're able to continue to pro provide support for our child care providers and get them through what, what is a tough time. So that's all I have. Thank you so much, Representative Wozniak. And, and your comment about, um, about submissions uh, regarding the bill reminds me to remind members of the public uh, that we have uh, that there's a fair amount of materials, uh, both about this bill, the prior bill, uh, the previous bill, others on our committee website, including uh, testimony, written testimony from different groups. And so just to direct, direct um, folks' attention to, um, to that. Um, and so in no testifiers, you had said, correct? Okay. And so we can move to, um, uh, I guess, maybe if we could just, uh, Representative Wozniak, and, and perhaps you said this enough, but I was maybe a little bit spacing on it. Can you just uh, confirm for us kind of the, of what exactly the um, the bill does um, in terms of continuing the, the I think it's it's relatively simple, but if you can just yeah. um, just confirm that, yeah. Yep. So it essentially it takes out that sunset date that's currently in place for the stabilization grants, um, and then takes out the the drawdown of those funds. So that were and then it it puts money in um, in fiscal year twenty twenty three um, to to sort of not have that scale down requirement and then it continues the base grants um, 
into the next few years to um, um, ongoing funding of that 153 million uh, for the grants to continue. Okay, good, thank you. Um, members, questions, comments on House File 4133? I'm gonna see what we have. Um, it is, it is, we are a quiet, very quiet bunch this morning, I must say. I don't know if we're all I'm still, still being our, uh, there we go, Representative Pryor. Yep, you can count on me. <laughs> okay. I, I, didn't I, mean to, I didn't mean to solicit anything. I just wanted to. Yeah, I, um, I sometimes please... struggle in the morning to be coherent, but, you know, at least I, 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 I've tried. I'll, I'll give my best effort. And I, I really just have a comment that um, I think this is the right thing to do. Um, uh, we, um, you know, already in the work that we've done, we've had the presentations we, we with working with Deed and that um, evening presentation that we had about um, what a crisis we still are in, in terms of um, the existing infrastructure of childcare still is there. I mean, it was here before the pandemic. It was exasperated by the pandemic. The stabilization grants have been a lifeline and we're not out of the crisis yet. So I, I do think that this is one of the, um, probably one of the most effective um, programs that we've had um, during the pandemic and that to continue on um, as we rebuild our workforce and, and get people back to work, um, which we are hearing on every committee probably, workforce shortages. And if, if um, I'm on the health committee and there is a crisis um, in, in the nurses in that workforce, they are leaving. And um, if we can do anything to preserve that workforce, um, we our lives depend on it. So. Um, it, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm strongly committed to this and the continuation of this, of these stabilization grants um, to make sure that the providers that we have now and the infrastructure that we have now, we don't lose. Um, and, I, and I do think this is at risk. So uh, thank you, uh, Representative Wozlik, for um, having a succinct bill and a common sense, pragmatic solution to where we are right now. Thank you, Representative Pryor. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for the bill author and Representative Wazlik. I'm just wondering, um, I can see how this impacts um, licensed child care centers and uh, you know, the VPK programs that um, have differing rules, but how, how will this impact our family child care, um, I don't call them centers, but units. So can you explain that? You're talking providers? about Talking to the chair and the uh, co-chair of the Family Child Care Task Force. Uh, so we'll back to <laughs> Representative Wazilek, um, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Bennett, for the question. Um, so this will continue, essentially, whatever the child, the family child care providers are getting right now. This will continue the um, the amounts of those grants that they are getting. So unless they unless they were to add staff, if they were to have a second adult, then they would be getting the the um, the amount for that second adult. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So do, do we have any information, um, Representative Wazlik, on, you know, what the differing amounts as it seems like this is slanted more toward the, the larger child care centers and maybe not as much to supporting the family providers. So with that original amount from last year that this now continues, is there any, can you give any information on how family, the smaller family providers are impacted or what help they get their additional funding. Representative Wazlik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the funding is based on FTEs. So it's, there's a certain, I think it's, I believe it's 32 hours um, is considered a, a one FTE. And so the, the um, family child care providers, if they're the sole provider, a sole child care provider in their home would get the amount for one FTE. Um, and then it would be the same, I believe it's the same amount for the, um, the centers and other providers. But if, if, if I'm not saying that correctly, I know there are folks from, from DHS here as well. Um, I did have a conversation with them about this, um, this bill. So if there are anything that I'm missing or not saying correctly, I encourage those folks to jump in here. And can you, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll go to, um, yeah, we'll go to Representative Franson and I'll, I'll ask my question. Representative Franson, looks like Representative Bennett, actually Representative Bennett though, you're, you're, yeah, you're still unmuted. So you thank you, Mr. Story. Chair. No, I just wanted Sorry. to say thank you. So. Okay, good, all right, Representative Franson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, so I just want to remind the members that during last year, I did bring forward amendments that this money was not going to be permanent. It was just during this time, we should not be, we should not be giving false hope to the providers that this was going to be a recurring payment. Uh, so I'm very concerned about extending this because eventually there's gonna be a cutoff. Uh, this economy is, is not going to be good. We, we think we have a $9 billion surplus. That money is going to be dwindling away. The February forecast was I think $74 million short of what was anticipated. The global economy is very, very shaky. And while we do need to stabilize the, um, the industry, every other industry also needs to be st uh, stabilized as well. So Representative Wazilek, could you just let us, give us an idea of with your bill here, where is the final cutoff? When will the, this program end? Or do you intend on continuing it into perpetuity? Representative Wazilek. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Franson, for the question. Well, I'm not running for re-election, so if this bill were to go forward, it would be for whenever whenever it ends in the bill, and then it would be taken up from there. So my my plan is to continue it for the years that are listed in, in the bill description. Um, I think we can have a conversation about whether we want to scale down, um, as, as was in the original proposal, whether we want to scale down um, on that so that it's an easier transition for child care uh, providers. Um, so that they, they're aware that those that funding is going to decrease. But um, as others have said, um, child care providers are the workforce behind the workforce. Um, access to, lack of access to child care is a big reason why we have a workforce shortage in other industries. And so I think it's important to support these providers going forward so that uh, working families have access to child care and can, can themselves um, either rejoin the workforce or um, you know, move into different positions. Lead Franson. If you want to, okay. <laughs> I, I just, Mr. Chair, members, I'm just, I'm just very concerned, and to hear Representative Wazwick say she's not running for re-election, she's bringing this bill forward, also leads me um, to be concerned that we may just be having this conversation, getting providers' hopes up. Um, truth to be told, I don't think it's going to go anywhere in the Senate, and so I, I am very concerned because providers themselves are. You know, they look to the legislature for for guidance, for help, and I don't know. I just I think this is this is a false false hope, and I don't want to. I just don't want to leave the providers on this way. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Representative Representative Franson, uh, Representative Kazizi, we tune. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Representative Wazwick, for bringing this forward. Um, I, I do want to just echo um, the, the fact that I, I share some concern um, with Representative Franzen about um, where, <laughs> where things are going forward. Um, but one of the things that I, I, I do um, believe is that, you know, specifically with the just the, the extended dates um, in in this bill um, to give our to give our child care providers a little bit more cushion. Um, again, I mean, it's so it still it still says that um, the, the base grants will become available um, and then remain, remain available for 2023. Um, and I, I think that um, when we when we have that discussion about um, where things might go in the future, um, it's it, it is it is an important part of the discussion that we know that this money most likely is not going to continue ongoing. But I think that providing just an extended cushion while we sort of return to normal. Um, it certainly seems like things are trending that way. And I certainly hope that that, that remains to be the case. Um, but I think that this probably is a, is a good move to help continue to stabilize the workforce uh, as we come out of COVID. And then, and then we can have further discussion down the line. But thank you, Representative Franson, for bringing that concern forward. I, I think it is valid. Thank you, Representative Katiza Wittoon. Uh, Representative Franson's hand is um, it, it maybe uh, I'm not sure if you're back, wanting to jump back in, Representative Franson, or, or maybe your hand was still up for before. I'm going to assume that's the case. And Representative Damoth is. So Representative Damoth, I'll call on you, and then we'll go from there. So Representative Damoth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just, uh, my observation, the conversation that we've had, um, thanks to Representative Wazalik for bringing this forward. Um, I'm not in support of 
of ongoing funding for this. We know that was a stabilization for a very difficult time. But the point that I wanna make with this is I think it's very important, the bill that uh, Representative Katiza Watoon brought forward for this study to actually identify where we're at. We need that data, we've got some of it, but we definitely need that data before we even consider allocating additional dollars going forward. We need to know where we're at. So more of just a comment, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Damon. Um, uh, I think we still got, I think those hands are, are up from before. Um, can you, um, so a couple of things, Representative Wozniak, um, there is a Great Start Task Force on the meeting now. I think actually several folks here are on that. I think Representative Damoth maybe, I could be wrong about that. But anyway, <laughs> I think I, I know Representative Boldman is on there. Um, uh, that is looking at the bigger picture and how this, how this works. Um, I guess I would anticipate that, um, uh, this is something that could end up connecting to the work of that task force in terms of supporting um, this sector. Is that, or maybe pause on that if you can just ask that, if it respond to that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it could, I mean, I'm not, I, I, I'm not on the task force, so I don't know exactly what their discussions look like, but I think the goal here is, as Representative Katiza Watoon said, is to have that additional cushion for a few more years. I think, um, again, we're seeing constantly hearing that these grants are helpful. I've heard, we've heard some people say that they have concerns here when they go away because they're not out of a crisis yet. Um, and so I think it's important that um, honestly that we put our money where our mouth is and that we say if we actually value childcare providers um, that we're actually gonna help them get through this tough time. Um, so whether or not it would intersect with that work, I think it certainly could. Um, uh, and I think it could intersect with any of the other work that we're doing, whether it's the Great Start Task Force um, what they're doing with um, parent aware or what the, the workforce study looks like. Um, that sounds good. I actually was going to ask a, a follow-up question regarding Representative Bennett's questions. I see that she's raised her hand though, so maybe I'll go. <laughs> but Representative Bennett, I was going to ask a follow-up question about your what you were getting to before about family child care, but I'll let you uh, come back in. Representative Bennett. All right. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'm, now I'm going to take this off a different direction, but you can pull it back ah. to that. Thank you. Uh, okay. Just a quick question. Uh, for the author again. So I'm wondering, um, you know, this does put the funding into the base. So therefore it, it will be perpetual until somebody undoes it. That's a word, undoes it. Sorry if the grammar's wrong. Um, so I'm wondering, Representative Waslick, would you consider putting a sunset on this um, so that we know it's temporary? Um, because at this point, going to the base, it would be permanent, basically. So just curious on that. Representative Wozniak. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Bennett. That's certainly something that can be done if, if that needs to be done, yep. Um, yeah, and, and thank you, Representative Bennett, uh, for that. I see you're, well, yeah, you wanna hop back in, Representative Bennett, please? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, okay, good. And actually, Representative Bolden, before I get to you, I did wanna clear up this question raised by Representative Bennett earlier. Um, Representative Bennett had had asked, uh, had talked about there being a potential difference in the treatment of child care centers versus family child care. And I guess I was a little confused by that. Representative Wazelik, can you just, is, does the bill in fact treat those, those areas differently? I guess the way I read it is people who are providing early care and learning are all treated the same. They're all, everybody, if you're doing the work, um, then you get a payment. It doesn't matter what setting you're in. So, but can you just clarify that, uh, Representative Wazelik? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep, that is correct. So it's it's not it's not treating one setting different than the other. Um, it's based on the number of of people that are working. So. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you, um, Representative Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just briefly, I just wanted to mention since the Great Start Task Force was mentioned, just and I said on that, just wanted to share a brief word about that. So we um, are in the early phases of work, but working hard, and I anticipate uh, this will come up in our discussions and recommendations. Uh, we certainly don't have those recommendations yet, but it's certainly um, stabilizing workforce and uh, uh, supporting uh, providers of all types is absolutely part of that work. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, just looking to see if there's other hands up. Um, and I guess then just the final piece um, for me, Representative Wozniak, as I'm hearing these questions and thinking, I mean, we've heard a lot really through the years in this committee about how the economics of early care and learning are just very different than other sectors. Um, and I guess, again, um, I think we've made this comparison before, but if we didn't have public support for, uh, for education between ages five and 18, 
then we'd have the same situation we have for early care and learning. Um, families would be paying a huge amount of their income. The, the teachers would be making poverty uh, wages, um, and it'd be a very uh, challenging situation. Some of the people would have their kids being taught by, you know, by the new boyfriend or the person who lives down the hall, which is what happens a lot of the time right now because of the cost, because of the structure. We don't do that for ages five to 18. So I guess um, I just feel like we've heard a lot of information in this committee about how the economics of this sector are different than other sectors and how ultimately there has to be some sort of public support to recognize the public benefit that flows from having children getting off to a great start and all that flows from that, which does include parents working, employers expanding, all the other benefits. Um, so I'll just sort of, I, I think uh, we wanna, as we're having this discussion, wanna keep in mind everything that we've learned in the committee these last really couple of years uh, about the, the public value of the work that is done, just like we recognize the public value of work that is done in the K-12 area in our public schools, and then also in the support that's provided for non-public schools as well in K-12 when it comes to um, tax exemptions and, and various other things, tax deductibility, et cetera. Um, so uh, uh, just kind of want to make sure that we're keeping that in mind. Do you have any other comment relating to that, or I suppose anything else, I'm not seeing other, other hands up, in terms of the intention, uh, your intention in, um, in proposing to continue these this form of public, uh, public support? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would say, um, I think I, I would certainly agree there that we invest a lot more, um, a lot more money in the, the K through 12 system than we do in um, our early childhood system. Even, even knowing what we know about data, the data and the research that shows that the early years um, are the really the most important in terms of brain development and, and long-term outcomes. Um, and so this is, this is sort of, this is sort of addresses both of the things that you mentioned. So it's the, it's the ongoing crisis that we have in our childcare industry. Um, with the economics just not working that we've heard over and over and over from businesses, from the child care providers themselves, from families that this, this model doesn't work, from, from folks who are working in, in those settings that this model just isn't working um, to ensure the access and the affordability for families and to also ensure that the folks who provide this really, really important um, early care are actually well compensated for the, the uh, important work that they do. Um, and so this is this is sort of an effort, an effort to address that, um, an effort to address uh, the need to invest, um, but also just what we're hearing directly from child care providers, which is um, they they need support, and this is one way that we can provide that support um, among all the other work that we're doing uh, right now and going to be doing in the future. I think this is one way that again we can step up as a state um, and say that child care providers are important, that we value them, and that we want to ensure that um, they're they're there. For, for their own sake, you know, running their own businesses for our family child care providers, but also that they're, they're there to support families um, so that they can work. Thank you, Representative Wozniak. Um, and I'll just reiter reiterate that for me, at least as chair, uh, I think that there is a, a, a clear need for ongoing public support of this sector. Um, this, may, this may or may not be the precise way that we should be doing it. This is one option among many, um, but the need for ongoing public support, uh, it's not just coming out of the pandemic, it was a deep crisis before the pandemic, um, but there's a real need there. I know this is gonna be a continuing discussion um, among, among all of us members, uh, uh, majority minority and all of us. And so we'll keep that up. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions or comments, and I guess I did give you that last word, Representative Wasserwick, so I think you may be, uh, may be done there. So um, uh, the chair lays over House File 4133 for possible inclusion in a committee budget bill. Um, we'll have further discussions. Um, members, uh, next week, um, uh, we'll be hearing on Tuesday uh, about the progress on the regulation modernization effort, which we had mandated last spring and put putting quite a lot of um, funding into, and also a couple of bills, um, a couple of proposals uh, relating to regulation uh, for us to just be um, uh, thinking about as that modernization process goes along. And then I'm expecting that on Thursday, we'll hear a presentation on the administration's uh, budget proposals I, and actually going through the actual bill language. We received a general presentation uh, about a month ago now, but this will be the actual bill language. Um, so looking to see if anybody has anything else, not seeing hands raised. Um, so uh, thanks so much for your attentiveness and I look forward to seeing you on uh, Tuesday. The meeting is adjourned. Thanks so much.